Rutgers legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Aloha and hello, my friend, and welcome to the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of EnhanceYourEdge.com, Brad Wilson, and today's guest is a legend in the poker media arena, Norman Chad. Before we jump into the conversation, I want you to take a second to imagine a time when no poker was on television, and it wasn't even a given that the WSOP would continue on a year-to-year basis. It was in this environment that Norman was asked to be a commentator for a game that he nor anybody else in the world even knew needed commenting on. Luckily for the poker world, Norman decided to move forward with the gig after being on the fence, and the rest, as they say, is history. Along with being one half of the OG poker commentary team on ESPN with Lon McEachern, Norman is a sports writer and syndicated columnist who has also written episodes for TV shows Arliss and Coach. In our wide-ranging conversation, we're going to travel through Norman's career in journalism, poker, his future projects, and the state of social media. You'll also learn how Norman got the WSOP commentary gig in the first place, despite knowing bupkis about poker strategy what being at the WSOP felt like before it became the spectacle that it is today, why Norman feels the poker community needs to chill out and lighten up over relatively minor issues, why sports betting is a surefire way to torch your money over the long term, and much, much more. So without any further ado, I bring to you my conversation with the one and only Wamboozler Supreme, Norman Chad. Norm, welcome to the show. Happy having you on. And I'm sure you know I am happy to be here. <laughs> I, I do know that. I'm a poker player. I read people for a living. And so I can tell definitively you are fucking jacked to be on the program today. Well, if I'd gone to grad school, which I never considered, it's possible I wouldn't be here today because I would have made something in my life. <laughs> But without extra higher education, I am uh, stuck with you and you're stuck with me. Well, let's make the best of a bad situation then. Right. <laughs> Press through this, uh, this conversation. I want to start with you going to Maryland, which was obviously your number one choice. Super pumped to get into Maryland. Tell me about that experience and uh, your life in journalism sort of leading up to getting involved with the World Series of Poker. Uh, Maryland was not my number one choice. It was not even a choice of mine. I did not even apply to Maryland. And as as I was applying to three other schools, my father sat me down one day after I received my first acceptance or rejection. And he said, by the way, uh, we don't have the money to go to those schools. Uh, I need you to go to Maryland for a couple of years and then you can transfer anywhere you want. And I was, I was crestfallen actually. I did not want to go to Maryland. And I knew also I probably wouldn't transfer. Why didn't you want to go to Maryland? First of all, Maryland back then, I, I wanted to, I, I grew up in, in, in suburban Washington, D.C., in Maryland. And I didn't necessarily want to go away, but I was applying to schools, which were, uh, at that time, I thought I was going to major in communications or journalism. So I was applying to some really good schools uh, in, in those areas, like Northwestern and Boston University. And Maryland was not a very good academic school at that time. It was horrendous. In fact, if you were an in-state, if you were in-state in Maryland, then if you just had a high school degree, and a driver's license you got in. So I never even considered Maryland. Uh, I had nothing against Maryland, but I thought I was going to go to Northwestern or Boston University or even American University in D.C. So yeah, never considered Maryland. And then I, and if I knew if I went to Maryland, I'd stay there. And not only did I stay there, it took me five and a half years to graduate. Why did it take you so long to graduate? Again, some of the classes that turned, there's a combination of some of the classes were so easy that I stopped going to them. And then I dropped drop out. And then I was working literally 50 or 60 hours a week on the campus newspaper. So 
So I, all my time was at the campus newspaper. So I literally missed a whole semester where I withdrew. Another semester, I got all Fs. So it took me an extra year and a half to get out of school. And if my research is correct, you didn't graduate with a journalism degree, right? And yet you were, it seems like journalism was your passion. It was. In fact, I thought I was going to major in journalism. And I went to a journalism, whatever the introductory journalism class was my freshman year. And that was like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. And by Wednesday, I said, what am I doing in here? This is like fifth grade journalism. It was just incredibly slow. And so I told myself, I'm not going to take any journalism classes. So I, I took zero journalism classes, even though that was my passion. I knew I was going into journalism. And that was a good decision on my part. I could get a better journalism education reading the Washington Post and the New York Times every day than going to journalism class uh, three times a week. And you were working at the Washington Post, right? Were you doing freelance for the Washington Post before you graduated? Yeah, I got very, very lucky. So I was working in high school for a community newspaper, a community weekly that was very good. And the guy who was our sports editor was also the high school sports editor at the Washington Post. So starting with my freshman year at Maryland, uh, I was co- I was working in the Washington Post Sports Department and covering high school games as an 18-year-old, which is just great. I mean, so my entire Maryland career, I was working part-time for Washington Post, which is uh, sort of an unequaled type of uh, apprenticeship. Yeah, it seems like you're probably just better off working at <laughs> doing that job and not even going to school anyway. Um, yeah, when you, when you think about it, again, just I talk about reading the Post or reading the New York Times, which is very helpful, or reading Time or Newsweek. At that time, this is pre-internet. But to work at a place like the Washington Post or any big newspaper, you know, that hands-on experience was a thousand times better than sitting in a class and uh, being told to do the five W's in your first paragraph. And this is a curiosity gap that's going to take me away from poker, but whatever. Like you said, you know, if we if we were amazing at, at other things, we wouldn't be here right now. So I, I do want to know, though, reading the Washington Post – what lens do you read a newspaper for folks that are interested in practicing a craft, like like an author, right, that wants to read a book? What lens do you read the Washington Post to learn more about journalism? How is that helping your education? Uh, it, it's simple. I mean, it's simple. If you if you wanted to be a carpenter or an accountant, someone would sit down with you and explain to you how you deal with you know how you deal with. Uh, the numbers or how you deal with carpentry. So reading the newspaper or reading the Washington Post, I was learning from two standpoints, writing and reporting. So I was seeing what they would do to report a story. Uh, and the, again, it's just, it's very basic stuff, but how they handle the story, uh, how they handle both sides of the story, how they, they look for facts. You look for facts to get you to the truth. You don't always get to the truth, but you're just looking for facts. So I read it from that standpoint, and then I read it from a writing standpoint of what worked. Uh, I also thought I might go into broadcasting, so I used to listen to broadcasts and listen to how broadcast writing used to be, because it's a little different than newspaper writing. So I read it from those standpoints, and then the other thing, Brad, is I I knew I was probably going to be writing a a column at some point, so I would read columns, both sports columns and op-ed columns, to see how how the best columnists would construct a column. Just like, you know, you might have to read 25 novels to figure out how, how do you go about to write a novel, which is very difficult. Columns are a little simpler. They're like 800 words, but you know, there's a construction to them. So I would read them both from an informational standpoint and then from, uh, as you said, learning from how they do things and how they solve problems in terms of how they get to the point at the beginning and the end of the column. And there's a lot of parallels, I think, to a lot of different industries, including poker there, that I think poker players tend to want to lead a solitary journey um, and try to figure things out for themselves when there are paths that have already been blazed that you can learn from versus just trial and error. And even going so far as, uh, you know, you want to make a website, you want to come up with a podcast, right? Listen to a bunch of other podcasts from the lens of how are they structuring this? Why do people love this? What's going on here? So that, you know, you can construct your show in a way that's palatable by human beings. <laughs> you're not just, you know, making it up and hoping. You actually have a model that you're following that, that can lead you to some level of success. Oh, without question. I mean, that's why if you're, if you're leading the solitary poker journey, it's more difficult than if you just have four or five poker friends that you can discuss poker with. That's why it's better if you're an artist. It's better to be in an artist colony. Artists, you know, so you can you can look at other art. You can talk to other artists. If you that doesn't mean you can't be a great artist if you're in the middle of nowhere. 
but your art is probably improved by looking at other art and seeing how it's done and talking to other artists that works in almost any industry. So yeah, that's the way, you know, I worked it when I was going to be a journalist uh, from early on, I decided I had to prepare as best as I could. And how did poker come into the equation? Like, how, can you tell me the story of how you got involved with poker? How'd you start playing poker? I mean, there's, there's actually, so there's two different things. There's just playing recreational social poker, which is what I started doing in college. And then that's a whole different thing to when I got involved with the World Series of Poker. And sure. Those, those are two different journeys. But yeah, in college, uh, uh, we just started playing like 25 cent or 50 cent limit home games. Uh, most of us, you know, three of us were roommates in, in an off-campus apartment. All of us worked for the campus newspaper. And like at least once a week, we gathered at my apartment and we just started playing, you know, wild card games and poker and drinking a lot. And uh, we did it quite regularly for a, a number of years. When you say college, what year was that? This would have been uh, it was last century, Brad. And uh, <laughs> it was late in the century. Yeah. So I graduated in 1981. So this is the late 70s, early 80s. So late, late seventies playing cards. I read somewhere that you also, you paid for your first wife's law school by playing cards. How did that happen? Well, that would have happened. That's actually a bad topic because so we got married in 1984 and then she ended up going to law school by the mid eighties. I was also besides our social game, which at that point was maybe a dollar anytime. It was a, it was a big deal. When we went from 25 cents to 50 cents, 50 cents to a dollar. I think we stopped at a dollar. But I started playing in a more serious poker game with other people, uh, lawyers, real estate guys, car salesmen. It was like a $20 anytime game. And the first year that my first wife was going to law school, it was Catholic University. It was very expensive at that time. It was like $17,000. You know, I'm earning like $25,000 a year. And we didn't have the money. and We had to do like payments with interest. And I hated it. So I decided that for my second, her second year that I was just going to save all the money to squirrel away all the $20 and $100 bills I could to see how much of the law school I could pay for in her second year. So that was a combination of, I had my best year ever that year, and I probably was 15K ahead, and I saved like 11 or 12K in the envelope, which was going to pay for most of the law school, that we were going to be fine. So the second year law school payment coincided with her leaving me. Uh, so it's, it's, it's always hard to have to, you know, re- recollect that, but, uh, yeah, my, my wife was very unhappy in the marriage, uh, very unhappy with me probably. And so she actually left before her second year, which I paid for through, uh, poker, but did not pay. She didn't ask for money for the third year to her credit, but, uh, and we weren't divorced yet. We were just separated, but yeah, poker paid for her second year at the Catholic university law school. That, that's so you're making 25 a year and you, you saved almost 50% of that through playing cards. Did you have, where were you living at the time? What was the location? Do you have any thoughts of like put investing more energy playing cards? Oh no, no. no. I, I, I love doing it recreationally, but at that time, you know, when actually uh, the one part I left out was between graduating Maryland and earning the 25 K a year working full time for the Washington post. I tried to be a stand up comedian for about two years. So I still had my thoughts on trying to do some type of comedy, whether it's comedy writing or comedy. Poker was never in my mind in any regard, uh, certainly not playing. I wasn't good enough to be a professional player. We were living in downtown Washington, D.C. And this was so long ago that when I got another I left the Washington Post to, to go work for a new uh, sports daily called the National Sports Daily, uh, which was going to compete with USA Today and just do all sports, though. When I left to do that job at the end of the 1980s, I had to move elsewhere in Washington, D.C. because my neighborhood wasn't wired for cable yet. I couldn't <laughs> get cable in my apartment. So I had to move uptown where a neighborhood was wired for cable to take my new job with the National Sports Daily so I could watch ESPN every day. And my life's been downhill since then. You watch ESPN every day, you have no life. Yeah, you know you can just cancel the cable, right? You don't, you don't have to. You don't have well, to I have to do a job <laughs> and then it just becomes addictive like online poker. Yeah, you just uh, get get stuck at five o'clock watching around the horn and five thirty PTI, and then all of a sudden, just consumed with ESPN. Yeah, it's absurd. Actually, cable. To tell you the truth, Brad, besides the fact that cable is like one of the worst things that happened in my life, cable just I stopped reading. So I used to read a lot of books. So now, besides just reading newspapers and magazines, I stopped serious reading because of cable. Late at night, when I couldn't fall asleep, you, you, know, you read a book. 
now late at night when I couldn't fall asleep, all right, let me go uh, graze and see what's on, you know, the 200 channels I don't even want to watch. So yeah, it really kind of ruined my uh, intellectual growth. Yeah, it's, well, it's easy. There's no like friction there. It, like when you read, you at least have to imagine things happening. You use your brain, you use your imagination. With the TV, you just sit in front of the box and you have all the visuals. You don't have to imagine anything else. It's done for you. Yeah, it's not even interactive. You can do some interactive things online on the internet, but when you're just watching TV, it is a very passive uh, experience and you don't have to do anything. That's why, you know, it's the term, the couch potato. You just sit there and you just grow into a couch and you just grow into a potato on your couch. <laughs> and I have to say in nowadays, uh, Netflix and HBO are doing great jobs of making us couch potatoes. Even if you don't have cable, because some of the content, some of the shows are very, you know, they, they use data, right? They, that, that's actually like a superpower they have. They know exactly what we love, and then they make things that are exactly like that so that we do watch it more, um, which is a, a difficult thing. But at least we can just binge it now, um, get it all out of the way in one day and not have to worry about it for another year. Uh, yeah, but then you're, 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 what, you're already binging one thing over one day. You end up binging an incredible amount of things. I mean, right, they, they turn into a science it's it's so much more directed towards individuals than than network television used to be, which is just going after broad audiences. And you know, there's only five choices at some point for cable. Now they can, yeah, they can take a look at what we're watching to begin with, and then they can structure stuff that means we're going to watch the next thing they're going to do because they've studied what we watched in the past. It's very insidious. It's it it really is like it's. Uh, I had this. This is again. I'm taking us way off topic, but I had this thought the other day when I was watching the Super Bowl. I thought, you know what would be sick if Facebook bought distribution rights to football? Then they could serve individualized ads targeted specifically. Like I see a Mike Bloomberg ad on TV and I'm like, what the fuck, Mike Bloomberg? I don't care about Mike Bloomberg. But like if Facebook or some social media that had a bunch of data were able to direct ads targeting specifically you while you're watching football, um, ad revenues would go absolutely through the roof. I don't know how great it would be for us. But it was just a, a thought that I had. No, you're you're playing above the rim there, Brad. That's a very interesting thought. I hope nobody listens to your podcast. <laughs> actually, Facebook will buy the rights to the Super Bowl and do exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll be watching uh, the Super Bowl on Facebook. So, moving a little forward. So, stand-up comedian. Spoiler alert: it, it didn't go so well, right? You didn't do very well. That wasn't a long-term gig. I was on the Tonight Show 17 times. Uh, you can't find any video of it. But yes, it did not go very well. I did. I was. It was my greatest professional disappointment. I was horrified at how mediocre at best I was doing the stand-up. And since we, I stopped doing it because we were going to get. I was getting married for the first of uh, a few times. I thought I was, I was getting married for the only time, and I didn't want us to be behind the eight ball financially. So I took a full-time job offer uh, at the Washington Post and essentially ended the stand-up comedy. And then how do we get to ESPN from the Washington Post? How does that, how do you become a sports broadcaster? What was the, the story of that? Well, I wasn't really ever a sports broadcaster. So the Washington Post, I wrote a column mostly on sports television. And then I mentioned that National Sports Daily to you, which came into business in 1990 and 91. They went out of business in 16 months. They were pretty much a mirror of my stand-up comedy career. <laughs> so after I did that, I then had several job offers that actually catapulted me in, in the sports journalism business where I was uh, something for a moment. So I had three job offers. I could go back to the Washington Post. Uh, I could go work in Europe, actually, for the International Herald Tribune, which was owned by the Washington Post and New York Times or something. Or I could work for Sports Illustrated. They were creating a new column that I could write. So I decided to do the Sports Illustrated. And one of the worst decisions of my life, I decided to do the Sports Illustrated job and moved to Los Angeles to try to write, uh, in my spare time, to try to write TV comedy. What was That's, so bad about it? Well, Sports Illustrated was a terrible job because uh, they uh, whatever you wrote, they just changed. I couldn't even recognize my own work anymore. They have a, 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 a you know, series of editors. It's like different colored pens, Brad. There's a red, there's a red edit, there's a red red, a red, a red pencil, a green pencil, a blue pencil, but you can never get through all the colors. <laughs> and anyway, I wrote, uh, you know, my column was you know, a humor column and it was sort of unusual and editors don't, you know, they think differently. So 
whatever humor I was doing, it had to get through like eight different editors. I, it reminded me like if you were at the Olympics and you were figure skating and if the Russian judge gave you a 1.0, you know, you're, you can't get a medal. Everyone gives you a 90990, but the one judge doesn't like it. So if one editor thought that my joke wasn't good, they just took it out. So they just took out everything out of my column and then I didn't even get a chance to rewrite it. So it was a terrible place to write creatively. I hated it. I hated the whole process of how we did the column once a week. So that only lasted for one year. And I moved to Los Angeles and somehow, how did I get into ESPN? I can't remember, but I wasn't doing on-air work for ESPN. I was, uh, I met somebody. Oh, that's right. I was doing Jim Rome used to have a uh, Jim Rome when he was first the, the sports radio God. Uh, when he first he first started ESPN two, when ESPN two debuted, and he had his own show, and they had me coming on there to do some work, to do some media stuff, and I knew some ESPN people, and I was doing some other stuff, and uh, then I started doing some part of the inter- PTI guest hosting and and uh, five good minutes and some other ESPN stuff, and that all led to when poker started, and even then. That was unusual because they just they they were bringing in another product uh, an independent production company to do the poker in '03. And it was a production company that had no poker experience whatsoever. It was essentially documentary filmmakers, extraordinarily good documentary filmmakers. Yeah, uh, 441 Productions. They had no poker uh, background, so the guys who knew me at ESPN somehow thought I was more of a poker person than I was, uh, and I also might have been the only person I knew with a gambling problem. <laughs> and so they said, why don't you consult with them? Can you just help them put them in the right direction of how to broadcast poker? I said, sure. You know, I mean, I, I never even played no limit hold'em in my life. So I did consult with them for several months uh, and helped them as much as I could. And then they called me out of the blue and said, uh, have you ever thought about uh, commentating poker on TV? I thought I was like, it was some type of joke. Have you ever thought about commentating poker on TV? It doesn't even exist. So they said, yeah, we're not going to hire a poker pro and you make a... You make us, you entertain us, you make us laugh on the conference calls and the emails. So, you know. Why didn't they want to hire a pro? Uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, the under, the if the main reason was the undependability of, of the poker community. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can't get, you know, you, gotta, you know you, I, we still deal with it. You know, I love dealing with Antonio. You know, Antonio, Antonio's fan area doesn't show up to production meetings. Uh, we're lucky if he shows up clothed for the broadcast. <laughs> you, know, you know, the idea is that obviously at that point, Time, you might hire Phil Phil Helmuth at that time, but you know it, it's there's an obligation and there's a discipline, so they didn't want to have to deal with the the uncertainty of oh is he even going to come blah, blah blah. So they decided not to go that route. And again, these were not to their credit; they weren't sports producers. So sports producers would think, oh, we have to hire the biggest name ex jock, you know, the biggest quarterback, the biggest coach, the biggest poker player. They didn't think that way, so they thought that I could do it. And uh, they were wrong in one, in one area for sure. I, I knew nothing about the strategy and didn't care about the strategy. So I couldn't do any strategy, but uh, they knew I could bring something else to it. And so I brought something else to it. And, you know, I didn't even know I was going to take the job first, Brad. I told him I'd get back to you. Yeah, I mean, so looking back on it, I had Matt Savage on the show and he ran that WSOP. Um, he was the tournament director and, and he told me that the year before, people didn't even get paid. Like, you Looking back on it, you think like, oh, that's a sexy gig, right? Where you're tournament director at the WSOP. And he's like, we didn't even know if there was going to be a WSOP next year. Like it wasn't what we think of it in hindsight. Did you go to the event? Like did you watch it before? I don't know how the uh, the commentating process works if you you know narrate after it's done. It seems like you would probably narrate after they have it cut and put together, else you'd be just spinning – way too much energy um commenting on things that just get cut yeah i didn't know how it worked right i mean again i had very little tv experience i had no poker tournament experience when i showed up just before the day before the 03 main event was starting we were going to be televised we were going to be doing seven broadcasts of the main event which was that that day was like a four or five a day event you know so like you know five or six telecasts first you know taking it from day one on and then one or two hours on the final table so I showed up and I met the uh, producer for the first time, the executive producer, the guy who ran 441. And we were in Binion's in their poker room. And I'm walking around with Matt Morantz, the producer, who hired me essentially. And one of the first questions I said to him was, so wh- where's our broadcasting vantage point? And he cocked his head a little and looked at me like, 
house from Mars. And then I, I remember I told myself, why, why am I using the term vantage point? I've never even said that <laughs> in my life. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be like Mr. High Balloon. So I said, oh, yeah, where, 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 where are you going to be broadcasting from? And he said in so many words, you can't be as stupid as you look. You don't need to be broadcasting from here. <laughs> you just mentioned we just we just put it all together and tape it and afterwards we go back and you broadcast it afterwards one hour at a time i had no idea <laughs> i had no idea so yeah that's what they did from day one uh so uh did, did you watch the main event like in the stands or yeah actually there's so there's a moment again i don't know anything about television so yeah i'm, I'm walking around as i actually do now but i'm talking to people during the main event i'm, I'm there for the whole main event uh, that year and there's a shot, there's two shots in early main event coverage of me sitting in the first row off of the feature table where I'm supposedly announcing. <laughs> I'm sitting in the first row next to somebody talking, you know, just talking. You know? And it's like they're brief shots and they, they didn't, you know, I think they left the second one in as like an Alfred Hitchcock moment or something. But they didn't even notice the first one until we had taped it and go, look, there's Norman in the first row. That's kind of weird. So, yeah, I was there the whole time. Uh, I was within camera shot, unfortunately. They taught me not to be within camera shot when I'm walking around. Uh, and you I had to get the vantage point, though. You needed the, I, the perfect I had to find vantage the right point. Vantage point. <laughs> uh, but I really, it was a learning experience for me. So I wanted to talk to as many people as possible and I wanted to be around it. And it was a fascinating experience. I'd never been around tournament poker, I'd never been around minions during the World Series. So even though I'd watched the World Series of poker on ESPN occasionally before that, which was always a one hour pro- broadcast of the final table, I had no idea of what it felt like. And it felt incredible. Uh, that first year and tell me how did it feel that first year compared to like now like now it's obviously like a spectacle and this massive massive thing how did it how was the energy levels when you were walking around watching the tournaments how many other people were watching the tournaments yeah it's it's night and day from now to then uh obviously we're talking about that that year was a big year actually that year was 800 people which was the most ever the world series now we're talking 8,000 people so we go from a, a gritty old Las Vegas gambling hall, Binion's, to essentially a corporate setting in a massive ballroom, several massive ballrooms, whole different atmosphere. Uh, but again, we're talking 800 people total, which you could just fit, you know, you could fit into one room there pretty much. And so everybody's just there and there's not, there's not a lot of people walking in through there. Uh, there's no, there's no attraction it's, to this day. It's hard to walk through. Uh, during any day of the main event, you can't really see, you know, you can sit on the stand on the rail there and watch hundreds of tables, but you can't see what's happening. It's a very difficult spectator sport. So it's just, it's a, it's almost like a closed boys club or men's club at that point. Everybody knew everybody uh, essentially. And they certainly did in previous years when it was literally a, a colony of a couple hundred people who'd come there every summer to play, uh, you know, a 15 events in the main event. This one had expanded. It had expanded mostly. It had been 600 the year before and when Var- Robert Varconi won a year too early, as it turns out for him, but there was a little Varconi effect. It went from 600 plus to 800 plus, which is, a, you know, that's the 33%, 33% increase. 33%, yeah. Okay. Now, what, with Moneymaker and then all the uh, the ESPN stuff, it went from 800 to 2,500, which is tripling. So that's a big effect. But so it still was a pretty small colony. And I still was fascinated to walk around and talk to people like uh, Johnny Chan or Amarillo Slim or Howard Letterer, or even, you know, I talked to that year, I talked to Daniel Grano for the first time. I talked to Kathy Liebert. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was it, to me, it was incredibly fascinating because this was a part of the gambling world I'd never seen before. And these people were fascinating. They were fascinating characters. Again, they weren't all in hoodies with sunglasses and headphones on. These were older people who had all, you know, some of them had careers, complete careers before poker. So they all had a backstory. They all were interesting. They weren't just 22 years old who had been sitting in front of a laptop since they were 16. Any of your, can you recall a favorite story from, from one of these characters back in 2003? Uh, a favorite story from them? Yeah. Well, I remember, you know, it was funny. I remember uh, <laughs> two of the people I talked to were Barry Greenstein and Phil Gordon. So, and I enjoyed talking to both of them. And I, I, I still enjoy both of them. Uh, even though Phil Gordon left poker a long time ago. Uh, and Barry's still in there. And Phil Gordon uh, was just, he was, for some reason, he was just talking about poker in general. And he, he, he he's the first, he told me that he thought he, he, that Raz was the easiest game. We we're just talking about all types of poker. And he's the one who told me, he says, you could really, you, you could find a monkey in a zoo and probably 
teach the monkey in the zoo Raz within two hours. The basics. He's probably right about that. Anyway, I mentioned, I mentioned Phil Gordon to Barry Greenstein. Now, Barry's the polar opposite of Phil Gordon on every level possible. And when I mentioned I talked to Phil Gordon, Barry just scoffed Phil Gordon. He's not a poker player. He's a businessman who plays poker. I just, just the way Barry said, he's not a poker player. He's a businessman who played poker. Just cracked me up. And, and Barry would still think that today, by the way. And Barry's obviously a much more accomplished poker player than Phil Gordon. And Barry uh, was playing at the highest levels of cash games at that point and hadn't played that many tournaments. But yeah, so Barry Greenstein is just, you know, he's almost always the smartest guy in the room poker wise. He's always been a great cash game player. And I just remember his immediate dismissal of Phil Gordon just, <laughs> just walking through here trying to publish books. So uh, I enjoyed that, that combination. Little did Barry Greenstein know, Phil Gordon was going to write multiple poker books and be a fairly <laughs> large part of the poker world for a number of years. Yeah, and actually he was then the host of Celebrity Celebrity Poker on Bravo for a few years, which was a thing for three or four years. Yes, that was the height of the poker saturation market, I think. Uh, the Celebrity Poker. <laughs> celebrity Poker on Bravo. So you, you go from – it's pretty interesting because, you, like you said, televised poker wasn't even really a thing. So you do this thing. Production company comes in. They make this documentary effectively. That is – very compelling, very amazing. I remember watching it, and the you know what you had going for you, and in not knowing strategy was the viewers didn't know their head from a hole in the ground either. So you didn't necessarily even really need to know uh, strategy to get by in those early days. I wouldn't imagine, and it just obviously, uh, yeah, I would have done much strategy, but you know I still say things today that are incorrect. Strategy wise, I don't talk much strategy today, Brad. But it's 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 so I always get upset when I go back and, and take a look for quality control purposes, take a look at broadcast what I'm saying that I like, I don't like. For in the early years, anything I ever mentioned would have would just is cringe inducing. He's going all in on a draw. Has he <laughs> lost his mind? I never go all in on a draw. But so that part is cringing to me. But uh, you didn't need to know much strategy, but it would have helped if I knew more. And. Even so, Barry Greenstein would have been watching like, this guy, he, he does, he's not a professional. He's a fucking broadcaster. What's he doing? <laughs> he would have told me that. Uh, he would have been right. And I wasn't even a broadcaster. Uh, <laughs> he's a sports columnist writer. Actually, they called him tournament day, incredibly rad when, they, when we did the uh, on-camera things that we taped, me and Lon McCarron, at the beginning of each broadcast. They, uh, they, they say, hey, Lon, go, hey, I'm Lon, I'm Lon McCarron, joined by tournament tournament or tournament player Norman Chad and I stopped us when we do we're doing that and I said I'm, I'm not a tournament player I'm not a tournament I don't even play poker you know I'm blah, blah blah and and Matt Moran says have you ever played a tournament and I had just played my first tournament like three months earlier at the bicycle casino uh I said I played one about three months ago just you're a tournament player I said, <laughs> <laughs> that's ridiculous because we got to give you some credibility so yeah they, they had me as a tournament player or I hope it was a tournament pro I can't remember that was <laughs> yeah I mean it's TV, right? You're, you're yeah. learning. You're learning about the TV business as you, as you get involved. I learned involved. quite quickly, yes. <laughs> so it, it explodes. Like you said, I think there was multiple reasons why a guy, an amateur from Nashville named Moneymaker is obviously like a producer's dream. And then Party Poker got a, or Poker Stars got a ton of publicity and the online poker world just sort of exploded the next year. And then the, you know, af, you know there was Fossil Man after Moneymaker. How did it feel to reach a level of fame where people are noticing you? Like people know your name from being relatively unknown. Uh, yeah, that, that part, for most people, that would be enjoyable. For me, that was a very hard part to accept up to this day. I, I just, you know, I'm a writer. I like to sit in the room and create. And I'm not trying to go out there to shake hands and be famous. If that comes with it, great. I'm trying to, you know, I'd like to have the, the largest audience I could, the largest room I could play in, so on and so forth. But I so was never looking for fame. So that part of it, and that fame was still limited, Brad. It's, that's limited to like poker rooms and, and Las Vegas and for some reason airports. Uh, I, got, I used to get recognized. But yeah, we, and they, they would re-show, they were re-showing those first couple of years. They would re-show those episodes dozens and dozens and dozens of times. 
And I was just grateful that we were on camera only for like 60 seconds at the beginning. Otherwise, I'd be more recognized. But that just comes with the territory. Uh, you get used to it, uh, or I've gotten used to it. I mean, I wander through the main event now every year uh, and talk to people, you know, for hours on end. It's exhausting for me. It's not my natural, you know, it's not in my DNA. But uh, it's helpful. It's good for the game. It's good for my product. It's good for us to, to accumulate information. So I got used to it. Uh, I would always prefer not to have it. But uh, my wife, my current wife, never got used to it, and I don't blame her. She she used to. Tony's always complained that people would just come right up to me like she didn't like she wasn't even there. Like they just walk right through her, like I was Elvis Presley, and they talk to me, and they wouldn't even notice her, and like they would interrupt our meals, and she'd go, "Excuse me, you know, I'm over here, you know, I'm just not the salt and pepper shaker." So uh, she she's she's never gotten used to it, and now I've I've learned to introduce her first when they come over. She's the more interesting person anyway. But introduce her first, and that's uh, helped the marriage last a couple extra years. Yeah, I think <laughs> a couple extra years. It, the uh, is it over or under expectancy rate right now? Oh, it's way over. We this was my this is my third and final marriage, and the first two combined uh, at separation only lasted less than five years. So we blew past that. I mean, we've been married now 12, 12 and a half years. So that's way over. I mean, everyone would have taken the under. Congratulations. And our, our wives almost are always more interesting than us. I certainly I, – I consider myself an introverted person. I like one-on-one -on -one conversations like this. I like talking about things that I'm curious about or that I have knowledge about. But in a crowd, talking to people is pretty close to hell for me. I can't imagine walking, shaking people's hands, being you know having to do that. Really, it's kind of part of the gig, right? It's part of what you signed up for, even though you didn't read the fine print because you didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know I was signing up for that, but it is part of the gig. And it's hard to complain about that because so much about the gig is so great. You know, it's been so much fun. And then you, you meet a lot of great people out there. I love meeting new people at the main event. But again, it's again, it's not my natural ilk to walk around, shake hands and talk to people and smile. Uh, when my friends or family have come out there and see me doing that, they think I must be self-medicated or had a lobotomy because they know how can he be out there doing that? That's you know he's an insomniac who just crawls into a you know a catatonic state. I uh, can't deal with more than four people at once. But you know, some part of my brain made me do it. Put your game face on and get out there. Um, hey, we when you uh, when you think about your your career in poker and you think about joy, what's the first memory that comes to mind? Uh, you know, actually, I, I, I've had a lot of failure in my professional career. So I actually go back that first year where we had no idea what we were doing and no idea that it was going to take off. So there was an incredible amount of uh, satisfaction at the end of when, that, when the Moneymaker episode started to appear and they were catching steam. And this is even before Moneymaker was Moneymaker. You know, the first day or two, there's not much Moneymaker. The first hour or two, there's not much Moneymaker. So the second half of these seven. So when those seven hours came out and they were resonating with people, and I, I always, you know, I told people, I'd love to do poker on TV, but nobody's going to watch it. Once I decide I was going to do it, it'll be fun, but nobody's going to watch it. The fact that everybody was watching it and talking about it, and it was actually introducing poker to a whole new group of people, it felt good. Uh, and I knew that whatever we were doing, I knew I was going to get a lot better at it. So if I did it after one year, and I didn't think I was going to do it for more than one year, I knew, well, this is working. And what I'm, how I'm trying to do it myself is working, which most people would have told me not to do it that way. So now I can even do it even more the way I want to do it. And plus, I'm, I'm blessed to be with these producers who know what they're doing. So it, it was professionally, it was probably my greatest joy of anything I've ever done to get through that first year and see how it worked so well. And there was a lot of curiosity too. When you introduce these characters that nobody's ever known before, nobody knows who Phil Ivey is outside of the poker world from day one. Nobody knows Sammy Farha. Just nobody knows Amir Vahidi, any of these guys. And so you're getting introduced to these characters. You're getting the backstory. You don't have the live updates to read. You don't know how it ends. Like, you know, watching it the first time, you don't know Moneymaker is going to win the WSOP, even though, you know, it, it had happened months earlier at that point. I think that made for a really compelling must-see TV. I mean, I, I can remember exactly where I was watching the Moneymaker thing happen, watching it on ESPN. And I was introduced to poker before then. 
But I will say that Moneymaker, everybody that's in poker right now, I feel, has a lot of debt to Chris Moneymaker in that he expanded the market in just an amazing way that allowed for folks like myself to forge a life. Everything that I have that's good in the world has come from poker. So Moneymaker's victory allowed me to do that. I've always joked with Chris that you know, part of my paycheck should always go back to him. I should always kick back 2% of my paycheck, and all of us in poker uh, owe him a debt. And part of it was just luck on his part. Uh, again, if, if he was, if he did it the year before, like Robert Barconi, there wouldn't be a moneymaker effect. I don't know if there would be a Sammy Farha effect as big if Sammy had won that year. So Chris had to win. He had to win the year that ESPN decided for the first time we're going to put seven broadcasts on, and they were so popular that they re-aired them literally hundreds of times. Uh, and then Chris has handled himself as well as you could handle yourself over the last seventeen years. But yeah, that Chris moneymaker that alone will you know puts him into the, the poker hall of fame. Uh, at some point, for the for the effect that he had on the poker community, I think he's in it. Poker. Did he get in last year? I voted, and I can't even remember now. <laughs> I think he made. I think he made it last year. <laughs> but, uh... last year? Did I forget? Because <laughs> yeah, uh, he was eligible last year. Yeah. So even if he didn't make it last year, I have, I have I have I have footage of him being inducted. You're in the front row. I see you watching. I'm it. probably in the front row. Uh, I vote for it every year. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that makes him a poker hall of famer as a contributor uh, under that category, obviously not as a high level poker pro playing at the highest stakes with the greatest success, but contribute contribution wise, he's, he's a no brainer. Clearly. And I, I remember the, the hand with Phil Ivy where he had trip Queens, Phil Ivy had a boat and moneymaker made a boat on the river. And I, I think about that moment and I think, wow, Phil Ivy gets busted. Um, I believe in like ninth and that him losing made him so much money <laughs> like moneymaker getting lucky made him so much money over his poker career after the poker it boom. it's just unbelievable how much money sammy farha made from finishing second like all of these guys were rewarded for losing over the course of their poker career which is uh kind of ironic and interesting let me tell you another thing i was so stupid about on two fronts so ivy was knocked out in 10th just before the final table okay 10th and uh, he was like the, even though the, the public didn't know him, he was the biggest name left. You know, he was a young phenom at that point. He he had a three bracelet year, uh, the year before uh, at the World Series. So he was the guy I was hanging my hat on, and I've hung my hat on that for the last seventeen years. When he got knocked out, and we were there live, I was heartbroken because we lost Phil Ivy from the final table. So I, that's the first thing I was stupid about. When Moneymaker went live, went heads up against Sammy, I was rooting for Sammy. <laughs> Sammy was like the Humphrey Bogart character, uh, just the way he looked, with the cigarette dangling out of it. He just looked like a gambler and all that. And I knew he was, I just thought it might be bad for poker. This is how stupid I was that some guy could walk in off the street, never played a tournament before from Nashville. He's an accountant and he wins the world championship. Uh, that's not a good look. We we want Sammy Farha, the veteran poker guy. <laughs> Bogart. I was rooting for Sammy to win because I had no idea that moneymaker winning was much more important. That's how screwed up I was. Well, and it's hard. It, it's a hard thing to know. It's easy to say in hindsight. It's it's an obvious in hindsight, but hard to know in the moment. I'm sure. It's so obvious in hindsight. So it should have been obvious in foresight. <laughs> it's just so obvious in hindsight. So yeah. Uh, yeah. What is up, my loyal Chasing Poker Greatness listener? Coach Brad here, and I just wanted to take a moment to ask you a simple question. How many times have you heard my guests and I speak passionately about the benefits of poker coaching? You get to expand your poker network, receive expert feedback you can rely on, and have your burning questions answered by a trusted mentor. Which brings me to the Poker Power Hour, a series of 100% free Live one hour poker webinars, master classes, and hand history breakdowns that kick off each and every Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The Poker Power Hour will be led by me, Coach Brad, as well as some of your favorite Chasing Poker Greatness guests. It will be your weekly guide for helping you plug your leaks, skyrocket your poker growth, expand your network of crushers and inevitably win more money on the green felt. The Poker Power Hour is premium content and live only. 
There will be no free replays or view on demand, and the content will eventually be released as paid training only. So head to EnhanceYourEdge.com, opt in to the Poker Power Hour, and get for free today what you'll have to pay for it later. Once again, to catch the Poker Power Hour every single week, head to EnhanceYourEdge.com and join the email newsletter. Now, back to the show. Let's ask the opposite question to my last one. So when you think of pain in your career at the WSOP, what's the first memory that comes to mind? I think of pain? Yeah, painful moment. Well, there's two separate ones. Uh, One actually is my WSOP, my limited WSOP playing career. Uh, I play three or four events a year, uh, most years. And then in regards to the broadcast, there's no such there's the double pain of the UIEGA uh, ruling the, the year after Jamie Gold, which just, you know, just just cut the growth in half. So when, when we lost all the online players, we had 8,700 players in uh, 06. And then we went down to 6,000 plus because of this government ruling, this, this, this rider on a bill, some Port Authority bill that somebody was able to put in to essentially eliminate online poker. Bill right. Frist, Senator Bill Frist from uh, Tennessee. Bill Frist. For, so, for it's worth. so you, you know, so then I, sometimes I, I, I take that and I put that together then with black Friday, which then it was a few years later where full tilt and poker stars were shut down. That combination of things was so painful because it was going to hurt the industry. It was going to hurt the telecasts. It was going to hurt the growth. And I, you know, I truly believe that if, if none of that happened, if online was still legal in, as it was, leading up to the Bill Frist thing, you know, the main event would have exceeded 15,000 players years ago. I mean, it's just at the, the years that, 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 that we were going up to, to the Jamie gold year, you know, poker stars alone was sending 1500, 2000 players full tilt was sending a thousand players. So just the online community alone sending people, I can't tell you how large the, the main event would have been. So that was the biggest pain. It, it just hurt everything in the industry. Absolutely. And party poker, party poker was the one that got whacked. And many folks don't remember that Party Poker was the biggest online poker site in the world, and especially in the U.S. when the UIGA passed. And because they were a publicly traded company, they had to pull out of the market. So they pulled out of the U.S., and that was where a ton of the damage was done. And then obviously looking forward to you know Black Friday was obviously another – Another killer. It's pretty much the antagonist on this show is, uh, <laughs> you know, life before Black Friday and then life after Black Friday. And here we are nine years later. And I've spoken about this a number of times that, you know, I think what's done is done. I, I don't think poker will regain what it had, that momentum, um, especially the online version. I'm very afraid for the future of the online version. I think live poker will last forever. But uh, yeah, it's kind of brutal. It's kind of a tragedy in the story of poker that UIGEA and Black Friday sort of cut it down in its prime, and now it is what it is today in the U.S. Yeah, in fact, and part of that tragedy, Brad, I know you know we've heard many, many times uh, that certain play- players, pro players' lives were greatly affected. Obviously, they, they played online poker professionally. They had to leave the country. They had to go to Mexico, Costa Rica, Canada if they want to keep playing. And they still have to do that if they want to play at a high level or play play 24-7 against bigger pools. The, the, the untold part of that is that online brought poker to, uh, again, all these recreational people who just used it as, uh, like, you know, just like you go out to the movies or another piece of entertainment. And it's particularly older people who were alone. Just would, you know, if you're, you're 60 plus, 70 plus, you would go online late at night, maybe, or, you know, in the middle of the night, and it'll be your companion. You'd go play low stakes for an hour or two. So that got taken away from so many people who were introduced to poker through online. Uh, it was a great companion. It's like TV is a companion over the years. You just have the TV on the background when you're living alone. So the fact that all these people couldn't play poker just recreationally was very upsetting to me. And I, you know, I'm very vigilant about, uh, we should be vigilant about online addiction and online gambling prompts and all that. But be, before we get to that, the fact of the matter is, is that online was just a great companion for a lot of lonely people or people living by themselves or older people. And the, the reality is too, that if people want to play cards online, 
they're going to play cards. There are places you can play. You know, you can get action down maybe for like a professional to play in, like you mentioned, a large population. It's a lot tougher um, or higher stakes are a lot tougher. But if you want to play low stakes, you can figure it out. Um, there, there weren't any systems in place to combat the addiction. For me, it just came from like this a self-righteous lame duck senator in the, in the state of Tennessee attached this rider to a port security bill because fuck it he he was going out of office and you know he didn't like gambling and so that was that and and i I think that thinking back to it even now is it's still infuriating that uh one person can can cause so much damage by the way that was a great microcosm of how washington works i I was telling my friend i grew up in washington dc and again i at some point though before i was going to go into journalism i was obsessed with the political process and thought I somehow might be involved in the political process. And seeing how the sausage was made in my teen years and college years, I went out, I would like to get as far away from the sausage factory as possible. But that that it is infuriating because what you're talking about is again is one senator putting a ride the bill had nothing to do with gambling, nothing to do with gaming, nothing to do with online anything. And you can put a rider on this is a very typical Washington maneuver. We could slide that in there. And you can you can change people's lives as we did in this case, but that's been going on in Washington for centuries now. That's the way the town works, or that's the way the the elected process works in in Congress. Have you ever considered you you might be a bit of a masochist, right? You stand up comedy, politics. <laughs> yeah, I was actually so I thought I was going to run. Uh, you know, I, I was born. In, I was actually born in Washington D.C. and moved back into, into D.C. when I graduated from Maryland, and. DC, DC politics were terrible. Local DC politics were terrible. And I, I kept telling my first wife, that I, I really want to run for mayor. And she said, you're out of your mind for several reasons. Uh, besides the fact, you know, on top, before she even got to the fact that no one's going to vote for you, <laughs> you're out of your mind. And she was right. So I never did, but that, that was the only thing I considered doing that it was so bad. And I, I grew up when uh, I was in college and, and then in my twenties, we had a very, very corrupt mayor, uh, Marion Barry who uh, the city was so screwed up that after he was sent away to jail, after he did prison time for some drug charges, when he came back out of prison, he was easily, he easily was uh, voted in as a first as a councilman. Yeah, they loved him there. But uh, I, I just hated D.C. politics. But yes, I was uh, very uh, masochistic to consider that on top of the, the comedy career. Yeah, politics I try to stay away from because I just get angry. I get, I just get angry at everyone, and I'll tell myself, "Don't leave a comment, don't message, don't send a tweet, don't do this." And then I find myself, somebody will say something that pushes me over the edge to where I do leave a reply, and then I, I feel instant self-loathing. Like, why did you do that? Why did you engage? It, it's, it's tough. I mean, we get in today's modern age, we get everybody's opinion all the time, and we learn shit about people that are close to us that. Honestly, I, I never want to know. <laughs> I don't want to know my grandmother's thoughts on Nancy Pelosi, my 80-year-old grandmother on Facebook. But here we are. I log in and then I, I see a thing and I'm like, oh my God. Like it, it's kind of uh, – it's a silly world nowadays. It is. And actually there's that old expression, ignorance is bliss. There's something to be said about ignorance in certain situations. You don't always want all the information on stuff. You just don't want to know everything and you don't want to hear everybody's opinion all the time, which is what, where we're at right now because of the technology. I, I want to ask you too, because you know, journalism was your passion and, and probably is your passion, right? Um, yeah, I still write a once a week newspaper column in the Washington Post. What do, you, what do you make of the misinformation online? the information that gets spread that has an agenda that people latch on to that's backed up by nothing. And it's just persistent and constant. What do you make of that? It's, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm actually, I was ahead of the bandwagon on this Brad, And, uh, so I don't mind tooting my horn on this. It is the most, it's like, it's one of the most dangerous elements uh, to the future of any democracy. So uh, that, that's not even an overstatement the, the problem with the technology, it's the greatest technology in the world to pass information along. There's nothing equal to it. But it is a case where it's like one step forward and two steps backwards because of what you just mentioned. And misinformation travels a lot faster than information. So you can, you can, it's like you can, you can create these electronic lynch mobs with bad information out there that people latch on to. So there's, there's no filter. Uh, you know, with the mainstream media, whatever its faults were, 
there's always a system. There's, there's qualified professionals that are, or that are broadcasting it and producing it, that are writing it and editing it. So that it's, it's this credibility there. They have real people. They have sources. They have standards. The stuff you're talking about, anybody can produce at any time. You know, Wikipedia has great, has, you know, Wikipedia is great. It brings the encyclopedia to, to, to the palm of your hand. But there's so much mis- misinformation even within Wikipedia. You or I can change any Wikipedia entry at any time. Anybody can change any Wikipedia entry at any time. I found that out five or ten years ago when I was galled. But this isn't a Wikipedia issue. This is an issue about what you're talking about, about misinformation, character assassination, purposeful misinformation and misdirection going out there to fuel the flames, fuel the flames. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little dry in the mouth. And it's very, very dangerous. And you can, you know, you can, you know, again, you can have stuff happening that can bring down a community, that can bring down an entire nation because of misinformation out there. And so it really worries me. Uh, and that's why it's, 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 you know, obviously I, I have a passion for journalism, but good journalism or, or credible journalism that still is practiced by, by a place like the Washington Post and New York Times is, is just one of the foundations of keeping this very fragile republic that we have from breaking down. I, I think it's, it's, it's an insidious threat to humanity as a whole. And it's maybe an unsolvable problem when, especially when you have, um, you know, we, we mentioned binge watching. I, I binge watched The Pharmacist yesterday. I don't know if you've seen that on Netflix or know that it came out, but it's about the opioid crisis and, you know, the, the cigarette company, companies spreading misinformation about the addictiveness of nicotine. And nowadays it's just on a whole nother level where there's no downside to spreading misinformation that keeps your shit running and keeps you making money. The only downside of course is the general effect on society as a whole and humanity. But, uh, you know, it just seems to be done in, in, in the pursuit of acquiring more power, keeping more power, making more money, keeping the money that you've made. And it pretty much. So this, what you're talking about then this is why it's so high risk, low reward uh, because there's such a downside to this bad information getting out there. And I remember one of the smartest guys I've ever seen in journalism. I, I got so mad when I saw him, he was correct about this, but the guy named Michael Kinsley, uh, he used to on the original crossfire in CNN, uh, which is actually the, the news model for PTI, you know, two guys arguing, but that was, you know, crossfire was uh, Michael Kinsley to the left, Pat Buchanan from the right. And it was, you know, it was just staged left versus right. And he's a really smart, he's, he's 10 times smarter than me, but when the internet started and you just said that this is probably an unsolvable problem and it probably is, it, it better not be unsolvable because then we're, we're completely screwed. But he mentioned that this is the new wild, wild west and you got to get used to it. And just the consumers got to decide what's credible and what's not. Well, that's a ridiculous, you know, there's, there's, there's an infinite amount of information coming across the, you know, the internet. How are we all supposed to decide what's legitimate and what's not? That's a, that's a pretty difficult job. It's an impossible job. But when he said that, I want, you know, I wanted to shake him, you know, upside down and go, it's gotta be another way around this. You can't just accept it. And uh, it's, we haven't found another way around it. No, I, I, a, f- a friend of mine who's, you know, 10 times smarter than me, extremely intelligent person. We were talking about just this thing. And he's like, you know, I could research something for a few weeks and find some semblance of the truth or get closer to the truth. But the thing is, like, even if I do, it doesn't, it's not going to change any public opinion. It's not going to change anybody that believes the fake stuff passionately. You can present them with all the facts. And if they have an emotional investment into what they believe, they're just going to believe it, period. And, And that's just the way it is. So like the truth just becomes uh, subjective and unobtainable, and it, it, it's very frustrating, I think. Yeah, it's a bad way. I mean, cable started this, and the internet has added to this, that, that we're all in our own echo chambers. So you just you surround yourselves with information that validates your opinion. Uh, this is a really bad way to go. So this wasn't the case before Fox Fox News was on the right, MSNBC was on the left. It used to be, again, more mainstream down the middle. There's biases, but you just present it as best as you can. And that's what most journalists try to do. I know that people on the right think that, you know, everybody in the media is liberal. There's no question that most journalists probably lean to the left, but you're just, you're just, you're just pursuing the story. Most journalists just say, pursue the story wherever it goes. That's, that's what we're trained to do. 
But right now, it's everyone has their own separate set of facts, as you just mentioned, and you just feed into those to that information. And real facts don't mean anything to you. You just have what's in front of you, and that just validates and confirms what you already know. Absolutely. It's almost jarring when somebody on like my Twitter feed, for instance, likes something that I disagree with or retweets it. I, I don't see it in my feed. And when I see somebody comment – uh, that's like on the other side, it's like, whoa, where'd you come from? Where'd this guy come from? But then like I can follow a bunch of people that believe differently than me and it's the same thing except the opposite. It's like a different universe. Like me and you, if we have different beliefs, me on Twitter is going to have a different universe than you on Twitter. It, it, it's divisive in that way and I understand why the social media networks structured it the way they did. I just think that that's an unintended consequence of like Twitter and the technology a bad consequence by the way it leads into the poker world you know we you know we get polarized on like minor things in the poker world <laughs> you know it's your it's it's what i think it's what you think and what i think is right and it could be something as stupid as you know in big blind ante should the should the you know should when they when they're out of chips should the enemy put in first or the big blind put in first now the fact that we spend more than 15 seconds on this just makes me go out of my mind <laughs> but people get dug in and you're either big blind Annie that way, or you're, you're on team never reduce this way with reduced and big blind Annie down the final table. It's just amazing to me how we get caught up in these issues and that they become just life or death when they aren't life and death. And re entries, um, the re entry versus the freeze out debate that's like going through poker right now. And, and I would say too, like a lot of the loudest voices in the room, especially on Twitter, are people that have absolutely no skin in the game. <laughs> they're probably not even playing any of these tournaments. Um, they're just hoping to one day be able to play a WSOP event, you know, sometime five or 10 years into the future. And yet they have this very passionate, emotional opinion, um, despite not even being involved at all, which is, uh, yeah, it's, it's frustrating, right? I think there, there's room for both. And yeah, it, either way, it's not going to be the end of the world. So I have a few few questions more, a little lightning round, and then we'll get you out of here. You can enjoy the rest of your day. So if you could gift all poker players one book, and it doesn't have to be about poker, what would it be? Well, I always turn to the dark side. Brad. Actually, when I, so when I was in college, I read Albert Camus' The Stranger, which just sort of defined it seems like it defined my life for the next 10 years in terms of thinking. So I would, it's not that long of a novel. Uh, I would tell them to read that to get a better, just a better view, better life view in general. Uh, I also read, uh, again, on a non-poker thing, I read an Ernest Hemingway book of his travels in Europe, which just told me it was very important to always get a worldview to, to understand how other people live. Once you understand how other people live, and this applies to the poker community, because I, I, I sometimes I believe that people who make their living from trying to win at poker don't have a open view to the other people who are walking in, in terms of treating them in a better fashion, in a, in a, a fashion that makes them want to come back. We just get sort of narrow and myopic on all this stuff. So Hemingway's A Movable Feast was the name of the book. It's, it's, I've reread it a dozen times. Just made me realize how important it was to, to get other places and see how other pe pe people think and live. And it just informs you in a better place. It just, it just puts you in a better place. And you know, if, Go ahead. No, you, you go ahead. Yeah, no. So it's just, I just, I just, when I see all the biases that people have over ethnic reasons and religious reasons and racial reasons, if you or I were brought up in, you know, ignorance is also, it's not only bliss, ignorance breeds contempt. So if you or I, let's say we have a negative view of Bulgarians or Sri Lankans for whatever reason, we don't know anything about them. If you or I were just shipped out at the age of five and brought up by a Sri Lankan or Bulgarian family for five years, I don't think we'd have a negative view of Sri Lankans or Bulgarians anymore. We'd be part of them. We don't understand how they live. So if you just expose yourself to other people and how other people think, it's going to make you a more fully developed person. So between The Stranger and A Movable Feast, I always recommend those books. Uh, and then Poker Wise, there's nothing ever better than A. Alvarez, who just passed away uh, last year, his original book on poker. So the Biggest Game in Town by A. Alvarez. If you don't get interested in poker 
and poker characters from that book, then you're never going to get interested in poker and poker characters. It is brilliantly written. It uh, it revolves around Las Vegas and the World Series of Poker, and it is just just it's just it's just, it's my favorite book in poker to read, and has obviously nothing to do with poker strategy. And believe it or not, I have not read that book, but I loved Doyle's autobiography, The Godfather of Poker. I loved. Oh, that was great. Doyle wrote like a short story, a book of short stories, um, little little tales. I loved Amarillo Slim's uh, life in a world full of fat people. Um, I love the stories behind poker more than I've ever loved reading a book on pure poker strategy. No offense to Phil Helmuth, um, the eagle, the eagle of poker out there swooping down, getting all the prey. But I, I don't really dig the poker books, even Gus Hansen's Every Hand Revealed, I really loved, um, just from a pure story perspective. Touching touching back on the the Hemingway book, though, I will say that you know that 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 is a greatness bomb. I think folks should experience different cultures than their own, different belief systems, because this is one of the fundamental things that have, has changed in my life growing up in Tennessee and sort of uh, living in an echo chamber. Like you said, everybody is a certain way. Everybody acts a certain way. Everybody does the same things and you don't interact with folks that are you know, kind of the polar opposite. And poker – gave me such a gift in being able to travel to Los Angeles, like Los Angeles versus Tennessee. You, it's uh, just, again, a different universe in the same nation where people believe a lot differently. And I think that living in LA, I, I got the opportunity to encounter kind folks, generous people. It wasn't a uh, generous heathens, non-Christians, you know, it wasn't this, right. uh, it, it wasn't the world that I was led to believe it was, which changed my worldview in just many, many ways. So I think the more experiences you can get like that, just the better well-rounded person you'll be. All right. If you could erect a billboard, every poker player has got a drive pass on their way to the casino. What's it say? Well, you know, the, the other end of Los Angeles, though, Brad, is uh, I always tell the poker dealers out here uh, that they got the toughest job in America dealing poker in Los Angeles. The poker community in Los Angeles is a, is a, is a little more uh, hard-edged. Uh, aggressive. <laughs> aggressive. And to that end, I play at Hollywood Park mostly in West Los Angeles. And uh, several years ago, it got so bad with how poker players were that they put up posters in the casino and they had dealers wearing buttons that said, no card throwing no profanity. It was like four no's of things that are so common sense. Like, you know, why would you treat the guy next to you badly? Why would you yell at the dealer? Why would you take the cards and crumple them? <laughs> All these things that they do that you, you shouldn't need, you know, you shouldn't need a civil rights act, for instance, to declare that all people are have equal rights in America. But we had to have a civil rights act in 1964 declaring what is obvious. You shouldn't need a poster telling you to treat dealers and other players kindly. So my billboard would be a combination of it's, it's almost like one of the 10 commandments, you know, the, the do unto others as you would want to, as you want them to do under you, whatever that would be. Just, just be nicer all the time. You know, it's, you're playing poker. If you're playing poker for a living, that, that certainly beats working in a coal mine. So you're really fortunate to play poker for a living, or you're really fortunate to have the spare time to entertain yourself with poker. So just enjoy it and be nicer to everybody else, and it'll be a greater time at the end of the day. And then I would twin that with the fact that there's life beyond poker. So I think I think you know we found out this this past summer, for instance, when uh, who was the runner up in the World Series? I can't remember anything. Who was the runner up in the World Series of Poker? To Hassan is saying uh, the Italian, uh, wonderful Italian guy. God, I can't think of anything anymore. So the, the fact of the matter is that if you you know literally go out and smell the roses once in a while or smell the coffee, it's going to make your poker better. If you go out and balance your life and do more than sit in the card room every day and grump about structures and the bad beats, it's going to improve your game. And it really will. You just, it's just the balance just helps you mentally and physically and spiritually. So I would tell the billboard would be, be nicer to the guy next to you at the poker table and get out and, uh, you know, bowl or uh or go to the library once in a while yeah it's it's interesting to me that poker players i I guess maybe it's just a 
a people thing. Like, you know, when you, when I was 15 years old and I worked at a grocery store at Bilo bagging groceries, I'm 15. So obviously I'm an idiot. Uh, I would, across the board, I would say almost every 15 year old's an idiot. You know, you think that you have some sort of authority there as a cashier or a bag boy at a grocery store. And you think you get this idea that maybe somehow you're better than the people that are coming in the store or something like that. Like poker players have this tendency as well, except especially in the poker players instance, they're older than 15, number one. And number two, if you're playing poker for any sizable amount of money, the folks that are playing as a hobby or recreationally are far more successful at some other area of life than the professional poker player is. And it's always valuable to talk to these people, get to know them. They have so much wisdom and knowledge they can share that can help your life. And they do so generously if if you just engage. I mean, if in a likable way from a, a lens of a frame of, you know, curiosity, like who is this person sitting next to me? What do you do? What are you great at? Like that to me has given me, it's such a fringe benefit of playing poker in that, you know, I, I, I battled at commerce next to Mr. Chow of, you know, the famous restaurant, Mr. Chow's restaurants. I've battled with Max Azria who recently passed away, uh, owner of BCBG and I'm sure tons and tons of other business folks, Bruno Mars, uh, people that I, I didn't know were successful. I'm also sure, you know, I'm 98% sure I've battled with some uh, serial killers and murderers and hitmen as well. But uh, <laughs> I think that's a numbers game in poker. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's just interesting folks that you can talk to and get to know. It doesn't have to be miserable. Even if you're losing, you can still gain value from each session that you play. And I think folks don't always see that when they're immersed in the process. And you bring up a great point with that. And actually it's, you know, that leads me to why I, I, you know, I'm a big mixed games promoted. I, I never played no limit hold in the casino and the no limit, you know, in Los Angeles, as in most places, 90% of the tables are no limit hold them. But the people who play the other games, which are more recreational, whether it's you know, stud or PLO or Omaha eight, uh, they're not the same no limit crowd. You know, the, in Los Angeles, the young, tough guys who are trying to make a living on it. There are guys, as you just mentioned, who have other history. And, you know, they're, they're lawyers, they're in the entertainment business, they're business owners. And you sit next to them. And besides the fact that it makes the session go by so much better because they're telling you stuff that's so interesting, you learn so much. And uh, there's just, it's so much. So that's why I, the mixed game people, I swear, we have a better time, I always tell people. We actually drink and eat with each other sometimes. I've you know started drinking and eating with these people outside of the casino. We enjoy each other's company so much, but it just it starts with actually you know sometimes I go up to someone such as yourself. Or you're actually older than someone I would go up to. Right now you have the headphones on because we're we're talking, but I go up to somebody at our table who's has sat down for the first time, and for the first hour they're under the headphones in the hoodie, and I go up and I lift that their right headphone up. I go hello, we're people. There's people surrounding you. We talk English. We speak English. Do you speak English? Look around. Enjoy yourself. And so, you know, sometimes I make a mistake. They put the headphone back on. And like, <laughs> in the history of the world, but just look. You know, just look to your left. Look to your right, and engage those people, and you will have so much better of a time. And your poker results might even improve. Just your whole mindset gets better. So you're right. You just learn from these people, and it's 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 a great experience. Absolutely. My, my fondest memories of living in LA were the relationships and the friendships that I made, some with professionals and some with recreational players. I mean, a guy, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, a few years back, there was a bus wreck in Tennessee. And a guy was driving too fast, he wrecked a bus, a number of children died. And it was actually uh, five miles from my kid's school, from where they were going to school. And Obviously, I was terrified when I, I saw the news and you know, had to make sure that they were okay and everything like that. And a friend of mine who's a recreational player, he's a movie producer, was the only person to call me from LA to ask like, hey, are you okay? Like, how are your kids? Like, how are you feeling? And I'll never forget that. Like, he, he's a guy that he's not a professional player, but since then we talk on the phone fairly regularly. We maintain that relationship. He's, he, in my mind, he's a great guy. We met up in, uh, in Atlanta. He went to a uh, or I went to my first bar mitzvah ever a few months back, but you know that's the value of of communicating with folks and getting to know them. And 
you need something to uh, make you a little bit happier when you're inevitably going on a massive downswing <laughs> so that you're not just in a hole and hating everything, right? Okay, final question, or actually, no, two questions. I lied. So, do you have a project you're working on right now that's near and dear to your heart? Yeah, actually, I always have projects near and dear to my heart that never come to fruition. Uh, again, even though stand-up comedy was my greatest professional disappointment, single disappointment, because I was so bad, I have been constantly disappointed, Brad, over the last 25 years over my inability. Poker's been a godsend for me. The TV poker's been a godsend. But my inability to reach out creatively elsewhere for other things I have interest in. So right now with us, uh, with the Supreme Court ruling nearly two years ago about gambling, we're pivoting to a, a new world, with, which is going to have more gambling in it. And again, just like I do with poker, where I try to do it from a different standpoint and not a strategy standpoint and have fun with it, there's a gambling area there where I really think that uh, I used to write a sports, I used to, one of my more successful professional ventures is I used to write an NFL picks column that was syndicated by the Washington Post where I picked every game in the NFL every weekend, but didn't do it seriously. I just left the coin on most games and made jokes. Uh, that was my most enjoyable thing before poker. And I did that very, very well. So my premise there was that for all of it, and, and the information keeps getting better and the analytics gets better. But for all that information they put out there, almost everybody is wrong half the time when it comes to betting on anything. There's a few people, savants, that can beat the system. And I've met some of them. But in, you know, of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people I know who have gambled in my lifetime on sports betting, I can list on all 10 of my fingers how many have won, probably eight of them. So that's still my thing. I like to come to that gambling from another standpoint. Uh, I like to have fun with it and just prove that, again, I can do just as well as you can without the analytics. And let's have fun with it. So one of the projects I am working on is being able to create a forum or a, a something for me, whether it's online, TV, where I'm talking gambling. But again, I'm making jokes. I'm having fun with it. And I'm not taking it too seriously, and I'm poking, I'm poking at the people who will give you every little bit of information to tell you that this is going to come true, and they're going to be wrong half the time. <laughs> I've heard that uh, podcasting is a pretty, pretty big niche if you, if you wanted <laughs> to get into that, that gig. I'm behind, I'm behind on the podcasting thing right now. Uh, that is an area that, you know, as I mentioned, whether it's TV, online, writing, podcasting is something that obviously – I could start right after we get off of this. I could start it up a minute after we get off of this. And maybe you just inspired me to do that after I walk Daisy. <laughs> um, going back to the, uh, the sports betting, I, I, I feel the same as far as sports betting goes. And my friend that I previously mentioned that's 10 times smarter than me, he bet sports professionally for, I'm not sure, seven or eight years. Um, did very, very well. And my friend does not bet sports anymore because he doesn't think he can find an edge anywhere. If that says anything to anybody listening this that, that thinks they can bet sports, this is somebody that is building models to model games, find inefficiencies in the lines, and take advantage of it. This dude thinks he can't find an edge. So what are you doing? Where are you going to find well, your I don't edge? think anyone's going to listen to you, but I hope they do hear what you just said and take it to heart. But I have found that uh, besides the fact that they need the action, Sports betters are pretty stubborn. I think like twenty bucks a game. Like if you have discretionary income, yeah, go for it. But like poker players, so many great, amazing poker players have just completely torched their bankroll on fire, thinking they can bet sports. I mean, it's just a a tale as old as time. So like, stay within your bankroll, do it for fun, but don't think like this is a thing. You know, uncut gems. You're gonna uncut gems it and uh, make a few million off of some random parlay in a basketball game. Which, by the way, uh, well, I, I won't spoil the movie. Go watch the movie in case you haven't seen it. But anyway, so final question, Norm. Where can the Chasing Poker Greatness audience find you on the internet? If they need to find me. <laughs> uh, actually, so I am, uh, I'm on Twitter at Norman Chad. Pretty easy. And I tweet on occasion. Sometimes I don't tweet for days on end. I'm not a Twitter fan, but I was forced onto Twitter. Uh, and now I am, as we speak, I'm trying to get the gambling thing going. So here in the month of uh, February, I am, uh, I've got normanchad.com back up, a website, which will include uh, my YouTubes that I'm going to start to do on sports, gambling, and life. 
So I, uh, yeah, I have a YouTube channel that I'm just debuting uh, in the month of February and normanchad.com. But the, where I do the most activity, unfortunately, is at Twitter. At Norman Chad. <laughs> How did you get coerced into being on Twitter? Who, who held you at gunpoint and made you get on there? My wife correctly told me. So there was somebody on there as me a number of years ago. Had my picture. You know, it had everything. <laughs> it, it was actually, it was, it was benign on the guys. He was from, I believe he was from the Netherlands. Uh, he was a fan of mine. And he was essentially just quoting me from poker broadcasts in general. And he wasn't always getting it right. And English was a second language. But he had my, he had my handle. So we decided to contact him because my wife said, well, it's, it seems benign right now, but you know, he could slander somebody or libel somebody or do something. You, you, you can't let somebody else pretend to be you. I said, you're right. So we, we contacted him. He decided he would give the handle over to me. If I sent him like two, I think I had to send him two, two photographs autograph. <laughs> uh, and so it just became my handle. And then people told me you really should have a social media presence. Which is in my business, you're supposed to. You're supposed to be on Instagram or Facebook or, or Twitter. Twitter was the least problematic for me. I've never been on Facebook, even though there's six or eight or ten Norman Chads on Facebook who pretend to be me, but I've never been on Facebook. But so yeah, I just got Twitter by accident because someone else was doing it. And now I do it and I hate that I do it. <laughs> being myself is a full time job. I can't imagine being myself <laughs> and pretending to be somebody else at the same time. It's too much. Where, by, the guy, by the way, boy, the Brad, he almost grifted me. I want to say he grifted me. After he gave me my handle back, he returned on the Twitter, and it's called Norman Chad's Quotes. <laughs> and it's like Norman Chad from the booth, and he still quotes whatever I'm saying on the air. So I think he, he kind of violated the spirit of it, but he, <laughs> he was smarter than me. Yeah, he one of those two autographed Norman Chad pictures, and then he was going back to work. He uh, went back. <laughs> Tell me, uh, before we get off here, I do want to mention the cameo thing. How the heck did that come about? What is that? Cameo, everything's tortured for me. Uh, who's, who, who, I'm trying to remember who uh, held my arm behind my back, twisted my arm to get on cameo. So cameo is a fairly innocuous thing. And a cameo, which anybody could do, is, is a, a, where you can, people can contact you and they pay you whatever you set. To send out, I can't, you know, send out a video to them. So, like over the years, people walk up to me at the World Series of Poker all the time and say, "Can you do a shout out to my buddy Joe on the, you know, on my iPhone right here and tell him he's the worst poker player in the world and say <laughs> hi to his his dog buddy?" And I go, "Sure," and I'll do that for thirty seconds. So, Cameo essentially formalizes that and monetizes that if you want. You can also use it for charity. Uh, you can designate as much as you want to go to charity. So, I do cameos now where people go on to Cameo. And they can find this also on my Twitter site. Uh, go on to Cameo and you pay. I, I charge 50 bucks. Cameo, by the way, gets 25% of whatever for anybody. It's like Norm McDonald charges $500, for instance. Cameo gets 25% of whatever it is for anybody. You set the price. So for 50 bucks, 37 50 to me. Uh, <laughs> for 50 bucks, I will do a one or two minute video, you know, shouting out your poker night or telling your boss that he's the worst poker player of all time, or giving marital advice or whatever. And I actually enjoy doing them because they're fun to connect with fans that way. And I do, and it's inexpensive for them. And some of it goes to charity. So it's it's fun to do. And uh, I haven't gotten that much business of it yet. I think I, I started back in September or October. I might have done maybe 50 of them now, 40 or 50 of them over the last three months. But they're fun to do. And again, other people, do, athletes do them a lot. A lot of celebrities do them. A lot of D-listers, such as myself, if I'm a D-lister, we do it uh, to reach out to our audience. Yeah, I, I've seen some of them floating around. I just didn't know the process of like, how do you, how do they say, people are going to want to hear from Norman Chad. We need to get Norman Chad onto Cameo. It's going to be a hit. You guys aren't going to believe it. Not that many people, poker people do it, by the way, so far, Brad. Like if Negrano or Helmuth did it, they would, they would be runaway hits on this, to tell you the truth, no matter what they charge. Because people would like to hear from them. I've seen a couple of poker people. Maybe Jonathan Little does it, or Jeff Gross does it. But he does a thing where he you, you contact him and he'll break down a hand for you for twenty five bucks or something or whatever he charges. But uh, not that many poker personalities do it yet. Yeah, I, I could I could believe that. <laughs> it's hard, like you said, wrangling poker players. I laughed early on when you you talked about the producers, like which wrangling poker players is a part of this gig too. 
and uh, it's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do. They made a good read early on that, yeah, these guys don't sort of live on the same planet and live <laughs> by the same rules. Like I'm supposed to be at a production meeting right now, but I'm in this game that I just can't leave. I mean this guy's giving it away. So – Actually, yeah. it's come up with us when we, we have people who come onto the live streams now for the final tables of the World Series of Poker who are scheduled. Now they're in a good cash game. They can't make it. I can never understand if they were in another bracelet event. Now I'm in a cash game. I can't make it. Antonio doesn't want to do the main event on if he gets to do a good cash game. He won't even come in to do the main event on ESPN. That's all you <laughs> need to know. Yeah, yeah, poker players are a different breed. They're probably making a lot more money. Shop groceries. I've run into guys like Antonio who haven't shopped for a grocery in 15 years. How does he get groceries? They get delivered. <laughs> Someone, he has an assistant. I remember reading a story about uh, Chip Reese before he passed away that it, he had been paying like a, a three or four thousand dollar water bill for like six months straight, and he like flooded acres and acres of land because he had a major burst, and he just thought that like this thousand dollar water bill was normal and what everybody <laughs> paid. <laughs> you wouldn't know otherwise. It's a different. Dewey Tomko likes to tell a story that you know when he was playing around the clock when he was a school teacher and he'd play overnight and then go into teach school that he could not tell you who the vice president of the United States was. In I don't think he told you who the president either. He could not tell you who the vice president of the United States was in 1978 or whatever year he was playing poker. To. As a teacher, very nice. That that a school teacher you know, <laughs> helping build education for our future generation. Dewey's wonderful. He's the best storyteller I've ever heard. Norm, thank you very much. I'm very grateful for having you on the show. It's been a joy. Let's do it again sometime. We can talk about your gambling podcast when it's out there crushing it. Okay, and thanks for getting me onto that. I will get onto the gambling podcast as soon as we get off the air here. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker Greatness. If you have yet to subscribe to the show, please take a second to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be. For more content from me, Coach Brad, please visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash enhance your edge, and I'll see you next time.